Welcome uh, to the Bangalore International Center, where Professor Thomas Trotman is going to speak on his new book on elephants. Tom Trotman <coughs> is one of the two or three living historians I most admire. Uh, actually, maybe one of the two living historians I most admire. <laughs> I'll leave the second person unmentioned for the moment. Uh, and leave it a matter of intrigue. Uh, I admire him for the extraordinary range of his scholarship and for the subtlety of his <coughs> analysis and for his great linguistic abilities, which lamentably I do not share, uh, for the felicity of his prose, and for the endless curiosity of his mind. So, he is a historian who, like all the great historians, is driven by intellectual curiosity. He knows nothing in advance. You know, history in our country particularly has become captive to ideology, where everything is known in advance, <laughs> depending on where you start from. If you start from there, Savarkar is a hero. If you start from there, Savarkar is a villain before you've even read what Savarkar has written or what other people have written on Savarkar. And Tom Trotman is, in that sense, a truly great historian because he's driven by intellectual curiosity, by the puzzle of what actually happened and what the sources might or might not tell you and what the range of sources are that you need to discover and synthesize and analyze. He's also someone who refuses to choose between a dilemma uh, that historians are confronted with, namely, is history a branch of literature or is it a branch of social science? Actually, it's both. And it takes great skill and artifice and learning to practice history both as social science and as literature. At this, you know, if, if you're an academic historian, you see yourself as a social scientist, you use technical, complicated language, uh, you've got some kind of physics envy, perhaps, uh, if you're a popular historian, you just tell a chatty, breezy story with no analysis at all. And the greatest historians are both social scientists and literary crafts, crafts people, and that Thomas Trotman is. He was, uh, did his first degree in America and then did a PhD in London with A.L. Basham, uh, the great historian of ancient India. And his first book is a study of the Arthashastra. So he started as a historian of ancient statecraft, uh, which is, then he moved to being a historian of kinship, and he wrote a magisterial book on Dravidian kinship. Then he became a historian of anthropologist, or anthropology, and later on a historian of language, and now, most recently, an environmental historian. Uh, so if you look at the sheer range of his work, I may have got the sequencing a little wrong, and some of these things may have been done in parallel rather than chronologically, but it's, that's another reason to admire his work. Not only is it soaked in the sources, not only does it display a profound command of the necessary languages, not only is it analytically sharp and precise and robust, not only is, it, uh, uh, is the research expressed in clear and lucid and elegant language, but it is also this extraordinary variety of his work. Uh, <coughs> I'd say with a historian like uh, Professor Trotman, who has produced so many outstanding books over a long and distinguished career, uh, readers will have their own favorites. My own favorites are three books of his, and other people will have other favorites. And these are Aryans in British India, which is an intellectual history of uh, British Orientalists and their understanding of uh, uh, Indian language, culture, and their affinities with the wider world. The book he's going to speak about today, uh, which is uh, Elephants and Kings and Environmental History, which is a book that shows the, sh the sheer range of his scholarship uh, afresh. You know, if you look at the wide variety of sources used, uh, uh, how uh, the history of Indian elephant, the history of the Indian elephant is tracked uh, along with the history of Indian art, Indian artifact, Indian <coughs> literature, uh, Indian ecology, Indian warfare. It's a wonderful book, and unfortunately, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, 
being sold today, but it's uh, on Amazon, published by Permanent Black, uh, our finest social science publisher. So please do get it. Published by the University of California Press Abroad and Permanent Black here. And the last uh, third of my uh, third uh, uh, of uh, Tom's books that I particularly like is a book called Lewis Henry Morgan and the Invention of Kinship, which is uh, a biography of a book written by a man called Lewis Henry Morgan, which radically altered our understanding, the history of anthropology and anthropological thought. It was a book that was, I believe, cited by Darwin, Marx, Engels, and a few other such people. And Morgan was never an anthropologist at all. Now, he is, Tom Trotman is not only a truly great historian, he's also uncommonly generous and decent man. And that's an unbelievably rare combination. <laughs> To be a great scholar and a nice guy, <laughs> as his old friends Tilaka and Baskaran at the back of the room will testify. I don't know how many other great scholars and nice guys you know Baskaran, but I know no other apart from Tom Trotman. Uh, and I have been myself the beneficiary of his generosity and decency a very, very long time ago. He would have forgotten. It's more than 30 years ago. And uh, I met him in Delhi. I was then, I had <coughs> just finished my PhD. Possibly my first book was out, but I'm not even sure. I was interested in uh, writing a life of Veria Elvin, uh, the anthropologist. And Tom had just published his book uh, on Morgan, uh, which another sign of the kind of person he is, was dedicated to a late friend of his, the Indian sociologist M.S. A. Rao, who had then recently died prematurely. And uh, I met him, and he was carrying this book. And he saw the look in my eye. And he said, Here, and I said, I was, I was working on Elwin, and I was interested in history of anthropology, and Elwin was a writer. And Tom talk, saw the look on his, in my eye, and he's, he'd had Indian graduate students before, and Indian friends. And he saw the look in, eye, in my eye, which meant, this guy wants a copy of this book, but he can't afford it. <laughs> he said, yeah, take it. He said, yeah, take it. It was University of California Press, probably $40 in those days. And in pre-liberalization, pre-Amazon, there was no way I could get it. Right. So he just saw, he said, yeah, take it. <laughs> it was in the corridor of the Delhi School of Economics that that book was handed over to me. And I read it uh, with great delight and enjoyment. And I was inspired to write my own book on Elvin, which should really have been called in, uh, um, in homage to Tom. Tom's book is called Louis Henry Morgan and the Invention of Kinship. My book should really have been called Verrier Elvin and the Invention of the Indian Adivasi. <laughs> but I gave it another title altogether. So uh, it's really, a, for me, a great professional and personal privilege to be welcoming Professor Thomas Trotman in my hometown. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you so much Ram. I, I fear the talk won't uh, at all live up to the introduction. I think uh, we might uh, just go home now and <laughs> when we're at a high. <laughs> uh, uh, both Ram and I have the pleasure, I understand, of appearing at this uh, very important series in this room for the very last time. We're bringing it all to an end which is a distinction of a kind. So I'm grateful to the BIC for this invitation to talk about uh, what has become my, my very favorite subject. And so it's a, it's a, the pleasure is mine. And uh, thank you, Ram, for uh, bringing us to the heights. And now let's come down to the, <laughs> the level of the elephants. First of all, I have to thank the Hegde Foundation, which is uh, uh, just three, uh, four brothers uh, from Gujarat who commissioned this talk and brought me to uh, India uh, to give a commission this lecture virtually, uh, honoring uh, their father, <coughs> KTM Hegde, who is an uh, archaeologist in the department in Baroda University for their. Uh, for, uh, to, to commemorate his life. So let's begin. I want to begin with the invisibility of the elephant, which is something that Ram touched on. Uh, the paradox that 
uh, elephants can be very present and yet invisible. Uh, for example, I, I remember going to Kabani Lake and being struck how very invisible a fully grown elephant can be who is very near as long as it's as long as the forest is still in leaf it's just surprising how how quietly they can move and how invisible they can be with their big bulk um, and in history the history of india they're invisible not because they're absent but because they're taken for granted they're present they're constantly in the picture but not in the in our minds. Uh, and it's that which draws me to this topic of uh, elephants, especially in ancient India, and then their impact on the war, uh, on the, upon the world, rather. Um, I also blame the Romans a bit for this invisibility question. I feel the Romans, as you'll see, uh, took a rather negative view towards war elephants. They used them for a time, but as we'll see, they really preferred to play defense instead of offense. And uh, I think the Roman attitude, the low estimation of the war elephant on their part has influenced scholars of the present day to think that this topic is a negligible one. And I want to counter that. So let's see if I can turn this thing on and make it move. These are the heads of discussion, the nature, invention, spread, and legacy uh, of the war elephant. And uh, beginning with the nature of the elephant, I want to show you a picture which, to see the original, unfortunately, you will have to travel to Oxford and see it in the, in the Ashmolean Museum, this beautiful, beautiful sketch, not a finished work, but a, a beautiful study, as it were, by an unnamed artist, an artist whose name we don't know, in the, in the Rajasthan kingdom of Kota, uh, about 1700 uh, of the present era. Um, we see this image, and we know right away that it is a war elephant. It's not just any elephant, it's a war elephant. And what is it that we see? Um, uh, we see uh, that it has uh, uh, decorations uh, p supplied by human beings, a bell under the chin, some studs in its ear, which might be years of service, perhaps, in the kingdom. Uh, we see bands around the tusk, and the tusk itself informs us that it's male uh, very, uh, <coughs> very clearly. And we see especially the streak of uh, must fluid from the temporal gland uh, in front of the ear, a, a dark uh, streak, vertical streak, which means that it is in must. Now this word must, or mudda in Sanskrit, is a kind of madness, is a way we might uh, translate it, but we have to be careful to understand that this madness is not a pathological condition in the human estimation of the war elephant. Uh, it's not a, a bad thing, it's in fact positively valued. It's that peculiarity of the war elephant that mudda is what is wanted. And mudda, by its human commentators, is, uh, is uh, identified as excessive joy it's not at all uh, anger or pathology or craziness. It's not the, that's a different word altogether. Viala, a dangerous wild animal, is the latter. But mudda is actually highly, highly valued. And that is because, as we'll see, uh, by the way, let me just say that in, in representations, visual representations, you will see that. Uh, must fluid, even though I mean, it's a kind of convention that the elephant is shown to be in must at the moment of painting, no matter when that happens, even though this occurs only once a year or what have you. Now, here's the poetic uh, 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 
equivalent of such a visual representation, uh, uh, we see uh, uh, the, uh, the word terrifying, terrifying, bhima, creating terror in the enemy. Uh, we see the riven temples, that refers to the, the, the black mark of uh, being, in, uh, being in must. Well-trained 60-year-olds <clears throat> in the Mahabharata, 60 years is, is when the male elephant is felt to be at his prime. And for some of us of a certain age uh, of the masculine gender, this is a very appealing idea, <laughs> <laughs> even if we don't quite believe it. <laughs> uh, gliding clouds. Uh, elephant riders, notice the riders are mentioned, but not the mahout, not the driver who's sitting on the neck. The driver is invisible too, very often, because he's always there, you don't need to mention him. It's that kind of invisibility I'm getting at, um, like moving mountains. So that's the nature of the war elephant, his mudda, his uncontrollable combativeness, which is hormonally driven of being in must, is direct, is highly desired because it's directed towards this business of creating ter terror in the enemy soldiers. That's, that's what I wanted to convey. And for no other animal is this the case. Uh, so uh, even, even the elephant hook, the ankusha, um, is usually interpreted in the sources, if you look closely, not as something to goad the elephant on, to impel him to greater uh, feats, but really to restrain that superabundance of aggression and direct it in a, in a militarily useful way. And so the Ankusha is not to prod the elephant, but to restrain him and, and guide him in ways that are ways that are useful. Well, we'll leave it at that. That's the nature of the war elephant. And in my way of thinking, the war elephant, of course, there are so many other uses of elephants for simple riding or for building programs, hauling materials, all kinds of temple elephants and so forth. But to my mind, it's the war elephant that is central and conveys value and is a model for these other forms, as I hope uh, I'll be able to persuade you. Now let's come to invention. It is my belief that the war elephant <coughs> was invented by the Indians in the late Vedic period, the period after, some time after the Rig Veda. Um, uh, not everyone agrees with me, uh, uh, but let me give you uh, some, uh, some reason to uh, think that I may be right. Uh, first of all, in the Rig Veda, the elephant is a wild creature, uh, a wild creature with a hand, the uh, mriga, a uh, husty mriga. Uh, you know, encapsulated in words like hati and so forth. Uh, the, the wild animal, but a mriga, a deer-like uh, wild animal, uh, and it's only later that we hear <coughs> of domesticated, uh, trained, humanly trained elephants uh, in the post-Rig Vedic world. So I'm putting it in a late Vedic horizon and I'm saying, well, shall we say 1000 BC or sometime after that. Uh, when we uh, look in the Rig Veda, uh, we find many uh, verses which are praises of kings or other uh, heroic figures, human figures, as distinct from the praises of gods. And in these dana stutis, what is being praised is dana, is gifts. Uh, what this shows, uh, in kind of negatively, is that uh, the gifts of kings would be of cows, of horses, of chariots, of slaves, and many things, 
but in the Rig Veda, not of elephants. Nevertheless, shortly after the Rig Veda, uh, uh, we find uh, royal gifts, including elephants, in huge numbers, impossibly large numbers, lots of hyperbole. But the hyperbole, nevertheless, expresses a structure of thought uh, in which the elephant, now uh, available as a captive trained creature, becomes an object of gift. And being the largest land mammal in the world, an appropriate gift for a king to give, and they, uh, elephants appear now as, as royal gifts at weddings, as, as gifts to Brahmin uh, priests or coveys, poets, uh, and the like. Um, let's see. Yeah. Where am I exactly? Oh, here's uh, King Anga. This is a post Rig Vedic one in which. King Anga gives 10,000 elephants, which is, of course, completely over the top. Uh, and there are even richer ones than that. Please notice that name, King Anga, uh, which means is connected with the near vicinity of Magadha in eastern India, the Middle Ganges region. We'll come back to that. Um, and he is sort of the first famous king to have a famous gift recorded in Vedic literature. Uh, so that's the Vedic period. Now, you ask, <laughs> what about the Indus civilization? We have these many fine representations of elephants on seals that are so w beautifully executed and lifelike that we take it the artist really had seen living elephants and probably pretty up close. Did they not have tame elephants? Uh, well, let me uh, show you my answer to that question. And my answer will be, these elephants, I believe, were captive elephants put on display in the capital. But we have no, and, but we have no uh, representation of, from the Indus civilization of a human being riding or driving an elephant, sitting on the neck, in other words. So I take it that these were elephants orphaned in the hunt or something like this as immature animals taken to the capital and displayed. And why do I do that? Because other early literate uh, Eurasian civilizations uh, provide parallel evidence. For example, from this Egyptian uh, tomb, a representation of the painting on a tomb showing tribute bearers uh, to uh, the uh, Egyptian pharaoh, uh, you'll have to look closely on the left-hand side to see an elephant that has a leash and a collar uh, like a very large dog, shall we say, but an elephant that nevertheless is even smaller than a horse. So I say this is an immature elephant. And we have actual archaeological remains uh, of immature elephants associated with kingship at the very beginning of Egyptian history, the beginning of Egyptian kingship, I should say, excavated by René uh, 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 <laughs> Friedman. Uh, she find, and the, these were uh, immature elephants in the excavation of a cemetery associated with the remains of the king and other grave goods. These elephants uh, from six to 10 or 11 years old had been captured somewhere, had been brought to the uh, kingdom had been fed along the way, but they were immature elephants, so the problem of managing them was not so great. The contents of their stomachs showed that they'd been fed local marsh grasses and things like that. So here we see the beginnings of the management of elephants by humans, but so far it's confined to uh, uh, immature elephants of 
of uh, un no more than 11 years old. Uh, here we're uh, at another state where elephants are desired as tribute from conquered peoples uh, in the case of the Egyptians. Uh, or in Mesopotamia, in the case of Shalmaneser, uh, the black obelisk, which is now in the British Museum, uh, shows uh, tribute uh, processions. Uh, this panel shows a large-ish elephant, uh, maybe more than 11 years old, uh, having uh, tusks already, but not uh, terribly large, and the other Tribute objects are apes or monkeys uh, being brought to the, uh, to the king uh, by uh, conquered people. So Egypt, Mesopotamia, here is China. Uh, perhaps it will surprise you as much as it surprised me to know that China had wild elephants more or less all over its territory in very ancient times. And this is the time of the first beginnings of Chinese writing uh, in the Shang period in North uh, China. Uh, here are different versions of the sign for the word Xiang, is, which is a pictograph. You can uh, recognize the elephant in it, the word that is still used today. Uh, so China, now virtually without elephants, had the elephant word written on those very old texts called the oracle bones, on which uh, were written uh, uh, questions the king had about success in battle and so on and so forth, um, and recorded in, in that way for us. Here uh, is a beautiful example of a very early bronze vessel from China in the shape of an elephant, fairly, fairly realistic, even though its body surface is covered with very mannered and, and uh, artistic uh, uh, formations. Uh, nevertheless, it shows a familiarity that the uh, Chinese uh, lost as elephants di disappeared. So um, these are reasons from adjacent civil early civilizations to say that elephants were known. Elephants began to be managed by kings. Kings uh, wished to use elephants as natural symbols of their own preeminence, the preeminent size of the elephant was a kind of natural symbol for the preeminence among his own people of the king, uh, and began to learn how to manage elephants. Uh, Shalmaneser of the previous slide uh, uh, has inscriptions which talk about royal hunts in which 120 wild elephants were killed, I hope that was an exaggeration. Uh, also talks about bring, uh, conveying ele uh, elephants back to the capital to display. And I think these have to have been these baby or younger elephants that were easier to manage and had been orphaned by the very act of hunting and then would be used in a menagerie, basically. I don't find any believable evidence of riding elephants at this early horizon contemporary with the Indus civilization, okay? That's the nature of the claim. And you can decide whether you want to believe me or not. Now, part three, the spread of the war elephant. I'm boiling it down to a, a chart that has somehow got slightly typographically uh, crazy in the transmission, so <laughs> please forgive the badness of this. But you see, I basically uh, start in North India, I include South India and West and to the East. Uh, let me tell you about these, about this matter of spread. Uh, first of all, in North India itself, my belief is that by the times of the Buddhist and Jain uh, holy books, uh, uh, elephant 
the war elephant was a, became established as as normal as normative shall we say for kingdoms in north india uh, and this uh, appears largely in the doctrine of the fourfold army the vedic indians at the beginning came into india with with a uh, a military culture of using chariots and horses. They were very good horsemen and uh, horse trainers and uh, so forth. Coming into India, they were moving into a land of elephants in the, in the Ganges Valley, for, uh, uh, above all. And adding the captive war elephant to the threefold armies of the Rig Vedic period. So, armies of foot soldiers, chariots, and, and, uh, and uh, <laughs> horses and chariots, cavalry and chariots. Adding to that, the elephant creates a fourfold army which becomes normative in the times of the Buddha and the Mahavira, uh, and uh, absolutely normal, un unremarkable, and remains a kind of ideal uh, for kings for uh, 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 centuries to come for a very long time. Uh, the, uh, there commenced a interstate conflict among the 16 major countries of India that are mentioned in standard uh, Buddhist uh, texts, in standard lists, uh, ranging from on the east, uh, Magadha and Anga, you remember Anga, and on the west, northwest, uh, Gandhara and Kambuja. And Gandhara indeed is named as a Persian province in uh, Achaemenid inscriptions. Uh, so the, these states start to fight among one another and the short story of, of this warring states period, as I think we could call it, is that Magadha swallowed up all the others in the person of the Nanda dynasty, but especially the Mauryan dynasty under Chandragupta the uh, first. Now this process uh, poses in my mind what I will call the Persia problem. Uh, hitherto, be before the first unification of India, by the armies of Chandragupta Maurya from about 321 BCE or so. Before that, the largest empire of that part of the world was that of the Persians, the Achaemenid family ruling the Persian Empire beginning with Cyrus the Great. Now, if India had relations with that, in fact, Gandhara and some other parts of India were provinces of that large empire of the Persians. And Indians served in the Persian army, drawn from those provinces, uh, and are mentioned by Herodotus in many passages, are even depicted at Persepolis in uh, uh, relief sculptures of the army. Uh, and interestingly enough, I just come from Gujarat, uh, where in Kutch uh, we have these wild asses, uh, which I didn't have time to go see. I would love to have, but in the Persepolis uh, monuments, they have pictures of these different nations uh, serving the great king. Signs saying, you know, this is a, this is an Egyptian, this is a Arab, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and the one that says this is an Indian uh, has someone uh, with a, one of these asses, one of these uh, Indian equids, not a, um, um, a, a, a proper horse as we think of it, uh, which suggests that the connection was via Gujarat, a sort of middle range, not the north. West. Anyway, uh, so uh, the Persia problem is this. India had a connection with the Persian Empire on the margin. Indians must have known about this big empire. Inland Indians must have had diplomatic relations and so on with the Persians. 
they must have been inspired to in ambitious thoughts of, of creating empire uh, in India. Uh, so why is it that the unifi first unification of India didn't begin in the northwest, closest to Persia, but in the far east, in Magadha and Angai, and essentially in Bihar and the borderland of Bengal? And uh, the answer I suggest to you uh, is that it is exactly the eastern countries of North India where the best and most abundant elephants have come. And I, I'll skip over the proof of that, but I think there's definite uh, reason to believe that wild elephants and in numbers and quality were the great advantage of the Easterners over everyone else. And that, I think, for me at least, suggests the problem to the Persian question is elephants, that the war elephant really gave the, the uh, added advantage that was needed for uh, the success of Magadha over the rest. Magadha had absorbed Anga already in the times of the Buddha, as we know, Ajatashatru. All right, so rushing right along. Uh, now let's look at the spread of the war elephant to the west of India. Uh, this map is, um, is all the sites in w of battles in which elephants took part uh, in lands to the west of India. Meaning uh, those of Alexander, no, but his successors. The, the, uh, the Hellenistic states of Syria and of Egypt, uh, whose, whose ruling Greek families were the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. Uh, these successors to Alexander, these were founded by generals of Alexander who fought among themselves, who div di uh, divided the elephants that, the 200 elephants or so that Alexander brought home with him from India before he, died at such a tender age of 30-something, uh, uh, and uh, leaving a kind of chaos behind him, and a scramble to acquire more elephants from India. And the winner of that scramble was the Greek ruler of Syria called Seleucus, a general of Alexander, who m moving uh, into India, the Indus, arranged with his army to try to uh, assert his control there, came to war with Chandragupta, which was settled peaceably, and with a exchange in which Chandragupta got what we would call virtually the whole of Afghanistan in exchange for 500 war elephants, which Seleucus took back with him to Syria and used against his rival Ptolemy in Egypt. And of course, the invisible, the unmentioned thing that accompanied those elephants, those 500 Indian mahouts on the necks, uh, uh, driving them and carrying with them all their knowledge about how to manage and control elephants uh, to the Hellenistic kingdom uh, of, of of Seleucus um, and taking part in, in all of these battles. The Ptolemies, being unable to acquire Indian elephants from the Mauryas because of the intervening territory of their rivals, nevertheless used Indians and Indian knowledge to capture uh, uh, the, a smaller variety of the, of the African elephant and train it up. And uh, for that reason, in the Greek texts of these kingdoms, uh, the Ptolemies, of course, you recognize are the family in which Cleopatra is born. So uh, uh, she, in the texts of, of the wars of, these, of this kingdom of Egypt, this Greek kingdom of Egypt, the Mahout, the driver of the elephant, is always called, in Greek, the Indian. So a Greek text will say, uh, in this battle, uh, this elephant had three archers on his back, plus the Indian. 
And so the Indian was stereotyped as a special meaning of, of that word, of that word in Greek of that time, the Indian. Uh, and uh, this carries over into Latin versions of the same historical development. Uh, the uh, Carthaginians and the general Hannibal uh, were right next door to the Ptolemies. Uh, they, apparently from the Ptolemies, acquired Indian knowledge and trained up elephants to turn against Rome. And Hannibal took an elephant to Cor across uh, the Strait of Gibraltar into Spain. So you see this history now is reaching all the way from here to Spain. So this is a pretty far reach, far out of the natural habitat of Indian elef Asian elephants. And uh, harassed the uh, Romans uh, with his elephants after bringing them across the Alps in famous scenes that you've all seen or read about. Um, for some 16 years of sort of guerrilla warfare uh, against the Romans. It was a remarkable, remarkable uh, feat. Um, uh, so the Hellenistic states of Seleucus and of Ptolemy, uh, Carthage, Rome goes to war, war with Carthage. The three Punic Wars end up with the final defeat of Carthage by the Romans uh, in the times of uh, Julius Caesar and a little later. Uh, the Roman Empire expands to destroy and replace the rule of the Ptolemies in Egypt and the rule of the Seleucids in Syria. And so we have the Roman Empire has captured the entire world in which Indian war elephants were used, and the Romans having in their hands the entire machinery of how to capture and train and deploy war, war elephants put an end to it. They, they really felt elephants were a double-edged sword. They could uh, be turned against their own uh, troops and so on, and took a more pessimistic view uh, and continued to recruit and train and use elephants, but in the circus, the Roman circus, where elephants became kind of stereotyped uh, as a necessary part. So that's the story in the West. I could go on and talk about the Ghaznavids and Gurids and other elephant-using uh, people to the West but I want to rush on and turn to the east, the expansion eastward of the Indian idea of the war elephant. And that immediately takes us to the Southeast Asian first kingdoms, really, of Southeast Asia from about the first century AD uh, in the present era. Uh, and these Southeast Asian kingdoms, as you know, were the kings, this was a kind of beginning of kingship, and, and the kings all had an Indianizing style. They adopted Indian religions, they built uh, Hindu and Buddhist uh, monuments. Uh, the monuments have Sanskrit uh, inscriptions of them, often very, very uh, good Sanskrit. Uh, they, the king is praised in prashastis that you know, say how the king is like Arjuna uh, and how his fame reaches all the way to Kanchi, Ah, Kanchi, Apuram, uh, in the Tamil country. So uh, the connection is very strong. And they have wild elephants of their own and adopt the war elephant using their own forest people to help them capture and train these elephants. And, uh, and, uh, uh, we ask ourselves, well, maybe they just reinvented the war elephant out of thin air. Well, of course, they didn't. It wasn't reinvented a second time. It was the Indian idea and the knowledge that was conveyed. And what's interesting to me is that so much of that knowledge was a very humble, practical people, these Mahouts, and also the trainers who were uh, of a higher status, uh, somehow this whole culture of knowledge was conveyed 
to people uh, who didn't read books, who lived in another country, spoke a completely different language. Somehow that knowledge was reconstituted in tribal people of another country, people of Mon Khmer or Cham ethnicity and linguistic uh, uh, language. Uh, and some of these people, the last vestiges of this formation, are still in place and are being examined and recorded by anthropologists. I'm very happy to say. So uh, that formation of knowledge is interesting to me and it, it, it flows somehow through apprenticeship and learning on the job and not through uh, reading texts written by Brahmins. So it's sort of elusive, it, but we, and we have to mostly infer its, its context, content, uh, but it can be done, especially if we have comparative ethnological accounts. Where am I? Let's see what's next. Oh, so the result are these magnificent depictions of armies in the reliefs at Angkor Wat. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I'm sorry, it's hard to see, uh, but it is a kind of gesture towards the Indian fourfold army, and it's a Khmer king, a Cambodian king, descending uh, with an elephant. He has a Sanskrit name, as you see, uh, and uh, uh, here's really a Cambodian version of what I'm talking about. Here's a line drawing of, of the kind of elephant you see, if you look closely, you'll see the Mahout has a ankusha. There is a second hook on this spear-like object. Uh, and uh, you see that there's a howdah in this case. And the uh, person riding it is of high status because someone who, that we can't see on the ground is carrying an umbrella with a very long pole to indicate the high status of the of the warrior on the top. So really, the highest status people rode elephants in Angkor Wat. Well, that's uh, an, just an example of this eastward spread. I should say that Southeast Asia and the adjacent province of Yunnan in China, adjacent to Burma, that was about the eastward limit of the spread of the war elephant. The Chinese, as I'm going to show you, uh, really knew about the war elephant and refused it. They had a negative attitude, sort of like the Romans, I think. For example, uh, a Chinese scholar named Wen, Wen Huanrong uh, wrote a book about the historical, the history of different plants and animals in China. He was a biologist, but he knew the, the ancient texts and so on, and he uh, drew these maps. The first one on the left gives the data points of the um, different mentions in written works, or in a few cases, archeological finds, of, of uh, elephants. Uh, mentioned in past times. Uh, on the on the other side, on the wait, <laughs> on, the, on your right, uh, uses the same information to draw the northernmost limit at different periods of wild elephants in China. And if you examine the map, you'll see that this northernmost limit is receding to the south and the southwest in the course of time until Yunnan in the west is all that has elephants. Uh, indeed, uh, today, this very day, uh, uh, Ch China has hardly more than, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I think I'm interrupting my own program with my, <laughs> <laughs> please ignore that pesky mobile, which I don't quite understand. <laughs> uh, uh, so where was I? Uh, the, the comparison with uh, India is so telling to me. The, India, the Chinese kings clearly had a kind of ethic that uh, Mark Elvin uh, explains in his, his really interesting book about Chinese environmental history. 
they had the feeling that a virtuous king would clear the forests of in animals dangerous to farmers and other productive human beings who produce food and pay taxes and st fill armies with foot soldiers. So they took a very n much narrower view of the value of elephants than did the Indian kings. Why did the Indian kings take a different view? Because wild elephants were a military supply for them, a military store for them of elephants that they could capture. Now let me tease this out a little bit. Uh, why did Indians capture elephants from the forest and train them up? Why didn't they just breed them in stables? Well, in the first place, elephants are very sluggish uh, uh, in their reproductive systems. They give uh, like a two-year um, uh, pregnancy, a two-year duration of, of um, maturation, uh, and usually only a single live birth. Occasionally there are twins, but a, li a single uh, uh, child is the normal thing for elephants. So the rate of reproduction is quite slow. That's first. Uh, and then uh, the elephant being the biggest land mammal eats almost every waking hour of the day <laughs> and needs, if you put him in a stable, you have to collect all that food and bring it to him. Thirdly, if you work the elephant, if you make him do some work, that subtracts from the time he has to eat and you have to make up that deficit with high energy food. And this high energy food is food that has to be raised by human beings because we're, we're experts at that. We have brains that need high energy food. We do a lot of processing to food before we consume it to release that higher energy load that we need to have big brains uh, to uh, lead us into uh, God knows what future. Uh, and, and elephants then will need to be fed in addition to lots of grass and lots of browse cut by leaf cutters and grass cutters, they also need cooked food. And so, of course, at uh, Mutamulai, the Mahouts would, when the elephants came in after a day of work, they would get a huge bolus of cooked rice, and the Mahout would push it into its throat. And uh, if it was a good Mahout, he would leave his hand in the in the mouth so the elephant could taste him and you know bond with him and be familiar with him so this addition of humanly processed high energy food was necessary to compensate for the time devoted to work all of those are good reasons why if we agree with the Arthashastra that elephants are not ready for work until they're 20 years old, it would be better to let them feed themselves in the forest for 20 years <laughs> before capturing them and, you know. So that is why the captive elephant is a sort of the extreme, a kind of extreme of domestication. The, Elephant, in a sense, unlike other domestic animals, is, is tamed, captured and tamed one by one for, through a history of 3,000 years duration. So every elephant, in theory, there's some are born in captivity, to be sure, but especially from the point of view of the war elephant, if you want, adult male capture is the mode and in the norm, and the only way to maintain a sizable uh, stable of elephants. And then after that, it's very expensive because you need the leaf cutter and the veterinarian and the cook to cook these treats 
and so on and so forth. So there begins to be a, an expensive establishment and it's even more expensive for those Greek Hellenistic kings who want to maintain elephants far from their habitat. Uh, but in a sense, their value is greater. Their military value is the greater because of this expense. It means you can deploy elephants against people who have never seen an elephant in their life, like Armenians or Gauls in living in Spain or France. Um, and that uh, is in some way what was done. Well, coming back uh, to the China-India comparison, these are maps of uh, ancient and uh, the eight elephant forests uh, mentioned in the Arthashastra and the modern uh, elephant preserves in uh, this era. Uh, if we interpolated maps drawn from the Mughal period up to 1800, I think we'd say that there's a, the shrinkage of the elephant range was not very great up to the end of Mughal times and only became really seriously uh, uh, degenerated by, in the British period and not at the very beginning. In the uh, 1700s, uh, officers of the East India Company Army had a baggage allowance with which they could buy an elephant to carry their tents and all their kit uh, from an Indian dealer. And then when they went back home, they'd sell it back to the Indian dealer. But of course, they were always taken advantage of because they didn't know the finer points of value. Uh, and they usually lost their shirt because uh, in, the, in the exchange, but that's another story. Uh, what I want to say is that the Brits' great uh, uh, failing in this was to introduce the sport hunting of elephants. The Indian Rajas did not hunt elephants for sport, did not put their heads stuffed on a wall. Uh, the Arthashastra says that his elephant people uh, should put to death anyone <coughs> killing an elephant and anyone collecting ivory from an elephant that has died naturally is to be rewarded. And so we see that food and ivory and so forth, uh, this, is, this is off limits. Uh, as to live elephants. And Indian kings uh, went hunting. They certainly enjoyed the hunt, but they did so from the back of a live elephant. They didn't uh, shoot elephants for sport. And the British brought this in, I believe, I'm working on this, uh, from Africa. I think that's where it developed European sport hunting, trophies, taxidermists, uh, uh, record books, that whole culture. Uh, that uh, brought such a carnage to elephant numbers in India in the 19th century, so much so that conservation laws began to be enacted before the 19th century was out uh, to prevent you know, the complete extinction of elephants. The Indian nation, the republic, after independence, uh, continued sport hunting as a earner of um, foreign exchange, uh, but only for a while, and eventually put an end to it. And those hunting lodges of the British are now uh, tourist, ecotourism lodges, uh, in which I've been privileged to stay, uh, in the wonderful forest uh, and animal uh, life of India. Sorry, that wasn't quite uh, well formed uh, sentence. Uh, so uh, here's a rare picture of elephant hunting, but the person doing this deed is clearly a forest person. He's not a, a sort of normative Hindu or <laughs> Buddhist. Uh, he's wearing a kind of skirt of leaves showing he's outside this construction. and. Uh, and uh, this is uh, terracotta from, uh, from Bangladesh. Let's see if I 
Mark Elvin is the uh, author of this book, The, uh, per, uh, the uh, uh, Retreat of the Elephants, an Ecological History of China, Environmental History of China. And his book really, I mean, he enunciates this royal, this idea that royal virtue includes uh, annihilating animals' dangers to man and extending rice cultivation, really. Um, and uh, that it was which put my mind to the huge contrast from India and the way in which uh, uh, in Indian texts like the Arthashastra, for example, if we look at the Arthashastra and its idea of uh, land use, uh, agrarian villages get first place, but pastures, forests, uh, trade routes, mines, and so on get to be anywhere in between the villages, you know? So the first priority is agriculture, but all of these other land uses are adjacent and available for exchange relations with settled agrarian uh, settlements. So I think that's a great difference uh, between China and India. Um, the upshot, and now I'll end, is uh, we are the heirs of this vision. Uh, this vision of protecting elephants for the use of the king, but also at the cost. I mean, Indian kings had to balance the uh, scales between the farmer and the elephant, who are, as we know, in a relation of friction throughout history. And the, and the king has to support both and somehow compromise their, <coughs> their different uh, contributions to the whole. Um, and uh, so the upshot is that India today has 10 times more wild elephants than China does, 30,000 as opposed to 300. Of course, 30,000 is not too many, God knows. Uh, there were more in the past, no doubt. The elephants retreated in India, but also they persisted at a certain level and India today is a place where wild elephant numbers are, as a result of that past history are, and present government efforts, are increasing a little bit. And so um, uh, I, I, I want people to know that this deep past of the environment, of land use and so on, has a bearing upon the very world we live in right now. Well, I'll, uh, thank you very much for your patience and I'll take questions. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Tom, for <coughs> that fascinating lecture, which uh, surely exceeded my introduction. Uh, uh, before I open it out, I have a comment and then a question for you, Tom. Okay, good. The comment uh, uh, is, uh, is to do with a, a map towards the second or third last illustration, which is a map uh, uh, on the left was uh, elephant forests in the Arthashastra yeah. and elephant reserves in contemporary India. And if you look at that map, this is a comment, you don't have to respond to it. Uh, the elephant forests in the Arthashastra, which do not exist, are towards the north and the west of the Indian subcontinent. But when you look in the east, which is, of course, uh, the epicenter of the Magadha Empire and so on, the more you have uh, elephant forests then, you have res reserves uh, now. Yeah. In the south, you have lots of reserves, uh, which are not there in your first map, yeah. which is further proof uh, to my contention that we southerners were never colonized by the northerners. <laughs> All right, and may it always be so. All right, All right. okay. So that, that's just a that's just a jocular comment. But uh, the question I had, uh, you know, I mean, see, in a forty-five minute talk, <coughs> there's only so much you can cover. You covered a great deal, but in your book, there's a section, and I want you to say a little bit about it because it's there in your book, and because you are started as a great scholar of uh, Sanskrit. There's a fascinating section in your book, Elephants and Kings, which all of you should get on Amazon, uh, 
elephants in king the environmental history there's a section on ancient indian treatises on the elephant oh, yeah. you know the gadha shastra and some others and that so tell us a little bit about that and then we'll open it up because what was the kind of extent of scholarly learning and reflection in ancient india and these i think three or four texts you talk about yes yeah yeah, yeah. so just a little bit about that and then we'll open it up yes uh, gadha shastra uh was a real science of elephants and it did produce real texts uh we know well that's the question what is the period is the question uh are they modern are they ancient uh, we don't know the maratha kings of tanjore and the maratha kings of the north left uh, texts uh, but are they maratha period productions or older we really don't know but they're really rich and detailed yes well yes yes they are rich and detailed uh, i i think one thing is clear uh, one scholar edgerton who wrote a wonderful translation of one of those texts from kerala called the matangalila edgerton argued that all of these texts are of unknown date but later more recent than the arta shastra in which the eight elephant forests are mentioned and all of these texts mention those same eight mm -hmm. clearly i th i think he is correct about that i think they're more modern of course they're usually attributed to some puranic scholar uh, sage especially one named palakapya um, who lived among the elephants and learned conveyed to human kind the science of treating their ills and so forth uh so there's a kind of mythological um surround in these texts which is just delightful for example if you have ever wondered why elephants uh, do not fly through the sky <laughs> if that is your question you should read gadya shastra and you'll find out that you know airavata and all of those celestial elephants had wings one day they all in in the himalayas they settled down on a branch of a tree but they bro the branch broke and they fell on the head of a sage named dirgatapas who cursed them to lose their wings <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you see yeah. it goes on like that And there are these various uh, curses uh, shapa and various then mitigations you know in anta and uh, it's that kind of a story and it's that way in which you learn about why elephants in their present state used to be much grander than they are now and now are merely very large very nice animals <laughs> yes. thank you so oh, uh, i should say yeah. one of those texts the hasti ayurveda ah. elephant diseases 800 printed pages of sanskrit is very long <laughs> uh yeah there's a question here oh, is the mic is the mic going on no yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, just hold up your hands and i'll call you off yeah yeah good yeah you want to introduce yourself or just go ahead? uh thank you for a fascinating uh, talk professor my name is anirudh Um I want to ask you about uh, how the Romans dealt with the war elephant particularly in the battle of Zama. Uh Scipio Africanus um used skirmishers velites to scare off the elephants and also had his infantry line up in line so the elephants couldn't charge at the formations. Um do you think it's a coincidence that both Rome and China which were very well known for highly disciplined infantry formations uh didn't use war elephants could it be that India did not have an equally advanced practice of using drilled infantry and is that why we use elephants a lot more well what a good question i near thank you i i haven't thought of that question <laughs> but uh uh thinking on the spot i mean alexander came to india with very disciplined infantry carrying very long spears 16 feet long called sarissas and they'd march in close formation and create a prickly wall that was pretty formidable he didn't use any chariots they were no interest to him he used cavalry but he loved elephants he he 
collected them while he was in India. He extracted them as tribute. He accepted them as gifts from his Indian allies. And he took them back to Babylon. He certainly intended to master this uh, science of using elephants. Now, because of the Roman success and their, and their attitude, negative attitude, the old Greek and Latin texts of military strategy have been lost and with them their information about how the Greeks and Romans used elephants in these formations. So alas, uh, the ending, the Roman uh, a abolition, you might say, of the war elephant was reflected in the literary remains of the literature on, so there's a big lacuna that I wish we could fill by some text that would be discovered in some monastery in Mount Athos or uh, somewhere. It might happen. Uh, who knows? But, you know, we don't have a, a real detailed picture about this. But thank you for a provocative question. <laughs> I just wanted to know if there is any historical information about African elements. Uh, yes. uh, the ancient Greek sources, the ancient uh, Greek sources regularly say that the Indian elephant or Asian elephant was larger than the African elephant and that the African elephant was afraid of it. How can that be? They were convinced of this. They must have been wrong, right? No, they weren't wrong. Uh, the African elephant is a different genus. It comes in two species. One is the savanna elephant that we know, which is larger, for sure. But there's a forest elephant that was thought to be a separate race now is called a separate species in Congo and Cameroon, the heavy, heavy jungle area. And we think the Atlas Mountains region, that is, as the uh, Sahara Desert expanded, some of these forest elephants were uh, pushed further north uh, into North Africa. And we think it's those smaller forest elephants that the Ptolemies and the Carthaginians trained up with help, help of Indians. Just a footnote to that, uh, and here is footnote. You know, Nepal has elephants, uh, and uh, not long ago, about maybe 10 or 12 years ago, they, they had new, some new images on their currency notes, and they put the elephant, except that it was the African elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. Who... Uh, yeah, 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 yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Professor, I've read somewhere that there was a, that that captive elephants uh, till the middle of the 19th century, till the middle of the 20th century, were subject to some kind of viral disease that often that did, didn't allow them to live long lives in captivity, and uh, and that that disease was only solved through vaccinations or something like that in the 1930s or 40s. Uh, have you come across something like that? And if so, that could be a reason why breeding in captivity, an additional reason why breeding in captivity was not so popular. Yes, I'm not an expert in this by any means, but there are uh, British period treatises on the diseases of elephants published in India and in Burma as well. And anthrax is a big killer. Uh, of elephants, perhaps that's what you're talking about. Uh, definitely, these were serious, serious problems and could kill a huge elephant in a very short time. Um, I don't know what more I can say about that, uh, but there is definitely a movement to replace the traditionary Hasti Ayurveda kind of treatment with 
sort of veterinary science of the Western kind in the course of the colonial period. And things like anthrax were serious problems, for sure. But that was true of all animals, really, camels and and cattle, hoof and mouth disease, rinderpest, and so forth. So I'm afraid I can't tell you much more on that topic. First of all, uh, Professor, thank you for a great talk. And I couldn't help but notice that your tie has a lot of elephants on it. Um, just, um, what, is there any, I mean, as a war machine, uh, the elephant doesn't seem to have been a very effective animal because at least in history and mythology you keep reading about how the elephant getting, uh, I mean running amok and therefore the king turning around and <laughs> others taking advantage of that. Was there any uh, non-war reason that elephant got to be venerated that caused uh, Arthashastra and Kautilya to say that killing an elephant is not a good thing. And uh, what I'm trying to say is yes, that. I, um, I, I catch your drift. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, the uh, the Arthashastra is a wonderful text. It's um, it's very pragmatic. It's very practical. One gets the sense that. The author was oriented in a very pragmatic way and talked to practical people, mahouts and things like that, who really knew what they were talking about. So I don't see a strong element of, of uh, there's no mythology in it at all, really. Uh, certainly the author of the Arthashastra regarded public opinion settled customary views as important and to be respected it's not very philosophical about the uh, the bases of such <coughs> beliefs it's simply practical it's practical for a king not to irritate people when there's a publicly widely held view uh, the the uh, but on the other side of it uh, of course, elephants played a rich life in Indian religions of all kinds. The appearance of Airavata in the story of Indra after the Rig Veda is only one example of that, and it's a very important one. Some of the earliest sculptures in India of, of you know, historic times show Indra as his own driver on the neck of Airavata, and his own wife Indrani, to be gender equal about this, she too rides on the neck of her elephant. Uh, so um, Ganesha, the cult of Ganesha, is an obvious uh, point of emotional and religious and spiritual and philosophical connectedness. But uh, of course, this iconography in an in a archaeological sense, a material sense, is a kind of Gupta age formation, not terribly early. Uh, so um, that's, that's the picture. As to your first point about the inefficiency uh, of the war elephant, this is the Roman view for sure. <laughs> can turn on you. It can go badly. Uh, but it wasn't. Every Indian defeat is attributed to. <laughs> <laughs> but it was not the view of, of people in a position to know, like the Artish, like Kautilya of the Artishastra, either Indians or the incoming Turks who founded the Delhi Sultanate, or the Mughals. Uh, such as Akbar, who was deeply attached to elephants, even fought on the neck of an elephant, uh, <laughs> which uh, turned out very uh, like a very wild ride. Uh, the the Turkish and the I mean the the uh, Barani of the of the uh, Turkish Sultanate, in his account, uh, says he 
mentions Gajya Shastra. He says the Indians say that an elephant is worth 500 horse. Now this is a Turkish, you know, from coming from a land of horses, <laughs> um, uh, adopting, embracing the Indian view. And that is the argument of a great scholar named Simon Digby who wrote a book called War Horse and Elephant. Your own book starts with a reference to Sanskrit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Unfortunately, this book is not known in India because it was written in Pakistan during a war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a wonderful book. It's called War Horse and Elephant in the Delhi Sultanate. It's a small, it's, el it's, a, it's, a, it's a great book. Yeah, yeah. uh, Oxford is bringing out an Indian edition of Digby's works. It's a wonderful book. But he shows that the Turkish sultans coming from outside nevertheless uh, believed that control of the flow of elephants and of horses in opposite directions in North India, controlling that was the key to controlling India. And they were simply adopting the Indian point of view. I mean, that was age-old view, the age-old view that elephants are essential to victory as well as horses. Uh, this very sentiment is repeated in the Aini Akbari of Mughal times, explicit reference to Gajya Shastra in the Ain, and explicit reference to the notion that 500 horses uh, are exceeded by a single <laughs> elephant. So, yes, sir. There's some people waiting. No, no, wait, 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 wait. There's some people waiting at the back. Elephants, why the Romans didn't, uh, what do you say, keep elephants would have been the cost and the space, right? Would that have been a big cost implication and the space implication? Because Rome is small compared to India. So, is there any evidence? <laughs> yes, Italy is small. Yeah. <laughs> India is small compared, to, uh, Italy is small compared to India, but it became very, very large. <laughs> I don't think space, uh, I think it, Italy had enough space for the elephants. <laughs> they did use elephants. There's a wonderful book. I urge you all to read a book, unfortunately, only in French. <laughs> Histoire militaire des éléphants, written in 1843. A Military History of Elephants, written by an artillery officer, uh, an Italian who became a Frenchman and who is a member of the Academy uh, and a scholar of Greek and Latin. Uh, it's, this is a wonderful book. And he says, elephants figured in every great war of antiquity from Alexander to Julius Caesar. So that's his argument. Scullard says, Scullard says, uh, every great general of antiquity, meaning Roman Greek antiquity, used elephants. So that's true. The, the Romans did use elephants. They used them against the Gauls of Spain and France. They used them, uh, perhaps even brought an elephant to England uh, at one point. And, uh, but on the whole, they decided they were skeptical because of this a possibility that elephants could be uh, maddened and uh, turn upon their own people. And many scholars and many individuals have agreed with the Romans on that point of view. It's just that I don't happen to be one of them. I <laughs> accept the Artashastra view that elephants are a key to victory and uh, that they're actually useful and not just, uh, this is not just a whim or a, 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 a kind of irrational practice. <laughs> we have time for two questions, one here and one there. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Professor Trotman, thank you again for a wonderful talk. Your depth of knowledge is absolutely incredible. But I had a specific question, and you touched upon it, and that's what triggered my thought. India has never been able to raise good war horses. And as you point out, 
the Vijayanagara kingdom basically got the Portuguese, brought the war horses from Arabia. We always have had this problem that India has not been able to breed good war stallions. But we do have very good elephants. In fact, as you point out near Magadha, even today, the biggest temple elephants actually come from Bihar. Ramachandra, which is the biggest elephant now in South India, is actually in Kerala, is actually from Bihar. Originally, he's a 60 year old now. So the point which I'm curious about over here is that perhaps, even though I concur with your view, it could be that the Roman perspective was slightly changed with their access to large war horses. And the part of it is that in medieval times, you know, we talk about ancient India, but uh, ancient history, but in medieval times, horses became like the mobile tanks. You know, they were armored, they could move fast, and you needed bigger and bigger horses, which we didn't have in India. Your comments on that, please. Thank you. That's a very important issue. The comparative, uh, well, the sources of both of these important sinews of war. India is one of the rare places where you have fourfold armies that have both elephants and horses. And virtually any kingdom in India would be have better access to one or the other, but not both. So, you know, it, uh, and horses had always to be imported from Central Asia. Why? Because horses, as opposed to asses and other equids, uh, were wild in Central Asia, Inner Asia, uh, and were especially bred in Iran, in um, mountainous regions, upland and temperate pastures, uh, and uh, Arabia uh, somehow or other, Iraq, uh, and all of these places were sources of horses. In the ancient texts, uh, Sindh is the, the sign of a breed is the sort of apex horse of India. So certainly military supply was a problem, constant problem, and constant importation was a part of that, but also interbreeding with Indian uh, indigenous uh, species from the Himalayas and other upland uh, pastures. But, uh, but I think, well, I think you've put your finger on the really important question. Um, my friend Sumit Guha at, uh, no relation. No relation. Good friend. <laughs> Good friend, but. Yeah, at University of Texas, is not only looking into this question, but he's taking horseback riding lessons. <laughs> so he knows this. <laughs> The subject to the bottom. So maybe, maybe he and I together can can give the answer to this really central issue about military supply. And I, sort of backing from that, Simon Digby's book about war horse and elephant is called the subtitle is a problem of military supply. And that made me realize if. He, it's not just a question of battlefield tactics, but of supply. That's the deeper issue, as you point out. And uh, military supply is halfway to environmental history and land use and habitat. And the fact that India has elephant habitat in the monsoon, deciduous monsoon forest, and that extends through monsoon Southeast Asia to South China, really, uh, similar, uh, favorable to indigenous elephants, uh, gives the elephant its prominence in that whole region, uh, whereas the horse seems to want uh, dry grassland and does better in Sindh than in Bengal. Uh, that seems to be a very important criterion. So in, to my mind, if you draw a north-south line down the middle of India, to the east is the elephant habitat, to the west is the, the pastures for cavalry horses that you see in Irfan Habib's atlas of the Mughal right. Empire. But they had always to import fresh stock from further west, from Iran, from Iraq. Yeah, last question there. Yeah. 
You mentioned Persepolis, and uh, <coughs> you mentioned the, the Indian soldiers on the, the walls of soldiers, but um, elephants are absent from the wall of <laughs> gift bearers, surprisingly. Yes. Um, yeah. And um, while there are records of ivory being used in construction yes. and so on, um, are there Achaemenid pictorial depictions of elephants anywhere in the Persian Empire? I do not. Uh, uh, not in the Persian Empire, but yes, in the later Sasanian Persian Empire, there's a wonderful hunting season, uh, uh, relief of a hunting scene, royal hunt, uh, which has elephants with Mahouts and uh, Persian riders on back who are attendants of this scene, part of the core of uh, people and animals who beat the game into the direction of the king and then carried off the uh, wild boars that were being beaten in his direction. So there's a Sasanian example of definitely Indian elephants with Indian drivers in a Persian context. Where? The earlier Achaemenid Empire is a different question. I have only two examples I can think of. Uh, one is that Cyrus the Great himself, there's a a text that says he was fighting a people in the vicinity of the Caspian Sea, uh, the uh, Caspian Sea called Derbekes. They had elephants and Indian f mercenaries fighting with them, soldiers. Uh, he, one of these Indians uh, uh, wounded Cyrus with a spear and he died. That's the beginning of the Persian Empire. Now the end of the Persian Empire. Alexander fought uh, Darius III at Gaugamela, and there were 20 or so Indian elephants with Indian uh, drivers and fighters on their backs. At the end of the Persian Empire, it's defeat by, by uh, Alexander. So there's a little evidence for the Achaemenids having a connection, not only with India, but with the elephants. But you're quite right. Persepolis has no, I'm sorry to say, no picture of, an, no relief of an elephant. And I don't think Herodotus has any account of Indians in the army of Xerxes using elephants. So it's a thin connection. Uh, the, I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> uh, well, um, thank you for, uh, this wonderful talk, Tom. Uh, you know, this is, is this the last? Uh, last but one. Last but one. So, uh, you know, uh, so this place will become to elephants what China is. <laughs> and we're going to move to a place which will become to elephants what India is. Uh, and where we will welcome Professor Thomas Trotman back for his, when he can, next comes to Bangalore. As I said, Thomas, uh, has is has written in quite remarkable works on a wide r array of topics. Next mm -hmm. time he'll get him to speak on something else. Meanwhile, all of you here get his book, Elephants and Kings, an Environmental History, published by uh, Permanent Black, uh, available on Amazon. And I'd like uh, Theodore Baskaran to just give a, a few concluding remarks. Friends. I'm sure you're all with me when I thank uh, Dr. Trotman for this wonderful talk. It opens up a new area of research that is history of an animal. And to know that, to go into that, you have to know the language. You can't, you, it's very difficult to do it only with the knowledge of English. Tom, uh, Dr. Trotman, with this uh, knowledge of Sanskrit, is able to do this. And uh, Karnataka being, having the, one of the largest concentration of elephants, I think that book should uh, be translated <coughs> into Kannada. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> we have, in Tamil we have started the work. The book is uh, okay. almost complete maybe two or three chapters and uh, um, 
by the end of the year that book should come. So his work on India, I think, should come out in uh, Indian languages, some of the Indian languages, for those who cannot read English. For instance, he's, uh, he's got a huge uh, readership in Tamil Nadu. He wrote a book, he wrote this book on uh, Ellis, a civil servant who, uh, in the middle of, uh, I think, uh, 19th century, he translated Tirukkural. He was the first to translate Tirukkural and also pointed out that Valluvar was a Jain, but that got uh, overshadowed by the later <laughs> debates. But the point is that these books, his books, should come out in languages, uh, local languages. Uh, I thank uh, uh, Ram Guha for his very nice uh, introduction, warm and intimate, which set the tone for the, for the lecture. Um, one person we should all thank is that Dr. Hegde, based in uh, <laughs> Delhi, who has made this possible. He flew Dr. Trotman from uh, America, from Ann Arbor to Baroda to give this lecture on Dr. KTM Hegde, who was a very famous uh, archaeologist. You know, he did he did a lot of work in uh, Ajanta Ellore area and also particularly in metallurgy. So we thank him for his, uh, uh, because of uh, his munificence, we are going to, uh, uh, listeners in Madras, he's going to give two talks in Madras and uh, on to Delhi for more talks on these topics. I thank uh, Ravi and his team for organizing this talk. Well, thank you very much. Ha, ha, ha.